So yesterday we left off with a rock falling and we looked at the amount it fell. Now what we're going to do is take derivatives. So I want to know the velocity, the speed, and the acceleration. All right, and we're going to do it at time one and time three. So after one second, after three seconds. So velocity is the derivative of the position function, which is s of t. So it's s prime of t. So this function is relatively easy to take a derivative. I'm looking right up here. So I'm going to bring the two down as a coefficient. So two times negative 4.9 is negative 9.8 t. So that is our velocity function. Now I want to know at time one and at time three. So it's a v of one is negative 9.8. The units we're in, we're still in meters, but you can think of s prime as the t derivative of s. So s is in meters and t is in seconds. So this is really ds dt. We have meters on the numerator, seconds in the denominator. So this is meters per second. Sometimes you see it as MPS meters per second. We always do that with miles per hour. MPH is miles per hour. But I like to write it out as meters divided by seconds or miles divided by hours. So that's velocity at one second, velocity at three seconds. So I'm just going to go and put three in for the T value here. Oh, decimals, no good. It's close to negative 30. Oh boy, 29 point, whatever it is, four, maybe. Good enough, meters per second. All right, so that takes care of our velocity. Check, speed. How is speed related to velocity? Speed is just the absolute value or the magnitude of velocity. You really don't want to use s for speed because we've already used s for our original function. So I'm just going to write the whole word. Speed equals um, absolute value of, I want it at one second, which is just positive 9.8. And speed, the other speed, at three seconds. Absolute value would be of three, which is positive 29.4. Last up, acceleration. So how do we get acceleration? You can write it as a of t, acceleration of t. It's the derivative, derivative, the derivative of the velocity. So you can write it as v prime of t. If you want to go all the way back to s of t, it's s double prime of t. So I'm taking a derivative of the uh, velocity function, which I'm trying to circle up here. So we're going to take t. What is the derivative of a first power? So I multiply by one, and now it's t to the zero power. So it's just negative 9.8. You could write times t to the zero if you really want to. But it's just negative 9.8. So good news is acceleration is always negative 9.8. So I don't care if it's a of one, it's the same as a of three, same as a of any other number, negative 9.8. Now our units are important. So our units, we did a ddt twice of s. 
so our S was measured in meters, and T, change in times, measured in seconds, which we'll abbreviate one over sec, not to be confused with secant. So we are in meters per second uh, per second or meters per second squared. Oh, we shouldn't really use, this is unit analysis. If you're not into science, units aren't very important. So I'll write meters per second squared. So this is the acceleration of gravity. Uh, no matter, well, if you get really far away from Earth, it will change. It changes technically the further away from Earth you are, but you have to get really far away from Earth before it becomes significant. And let's see, so it'll be always negative 9.8 meters per second squared. So that's the acceleration of gravity. If you measure the other units, whatever they are, you probably know what it is. At some point, it'll come up again. And so this is meters per second. This is the metric measurement. So next up, we have another example. So we're going to do two more word problems here. We have a dynamite blast that explodes and shoots a rock up. So we're going to pretend this rock went straight up with the height given by this function right here. So before we get started on anything, if we write our square term first, we'd probably normally write it like this. Now graphing, we don't really need calculus at all to graph this. This is a sad parabola. I can certainly factor out. You can always do algebra first. So I can factor out a negative 16t, and we'll be left with t minus 10 right here. So when we graph, it can be very useful to know these different forms. So if we think of, now normally I would call it an x-intercept. In this case, our variable is t, so I'm going to call it a t-intercept. And there's our s-axis and our t-axis. So what this tells me, there's an x-intercept, or a t-intercept at 0 and at 10. And graphing this out, it's a sad parabola. So you could answer this question. That is a really sad parabola. I can do better. That's yeah, a little better. Uh, we are going to look for this point right here. Now, if you paid attention to pre-calculus class, that's called the vertex. And you can use your negative b over 2a to find the vertex. But we're going to do it in a slightly different way because we are learning calculus now. So we're going to answer a few questions here. Part A, when does a rock reach maximum height? So from parabolas, you should know already that halfway between the x-intercepts will be the vertex. So halfway between 0 and 10 is 5, but let's not use that fact. What calculus properties of this graph can I use to determine max height? So when I say calculus properties, well, the only real calculus property we have of this graph, we know it's continuous, so limits would be nice, but we want to think about the slope. So thinking about the slope, maximum height certainly occurs right here. What properties does this function have slope-wise? So right here, our slope's actually flat. So I want to figure out when is the slope 
flat, which is when is the slope zero. So the slope is s prime of t equals zero. So exactly when the slope is zero. And zero, of course, is flat or horizontal. So we got s of t. Let's figure out what is s prime. I did some algebra already. We can use any of the three forms to do calculus on. I, you can do the product rule if you really want to, but I'm going to avoid it. For me, it's late, and I don't really want to do the product rule, so I'm going to do the uh, sum rule right here off the one I underlined. So I'll rewrite s of t here. Negative 16t squared plus 160t. So this is our s of t. So what is s prime? Negative 16 times 2 is negative 32t plus 160. So we just dropped the power by 1, multiply by the power, so 16 got doubled to 32, and this is t to the first power, so you bring the first, multiply 1 times 160 is 160, and you could write t to the 0 power, but I'm not going to do that. And I want to know, when is this equal to 0? So we're intentionally setting this equal to 0. So I'm setting it equal to 0. And here's a linear equation. We're just going to add 32t, or we could factor. And t equals 160 over 32. Uh-oh, fractions. Oh boy, 80 over 16, seems right, 8 over, 40 over 8. I like to just pretend I know it's 5, but let's do this for real, 20 over 4, which is 5, all right. So that's our t value, 5, yes, of course, a good pre-calculus student could have told us that already, uh, but we want to use calculus tools now that we're in calculus class. So when? The answer is after five seconds. And how, uh, that's right, how high is the max height? So what is this maximum? So if we just naively take s prime and plug in 5, well, we're going to get out 0. So that absolutely does not answer when is the max height, or what is the max height. That tells you the slope at the max height, so that's pretty useless right here. What I need to do is take 5 and plug it into the s function. Now my s looks just like my 5. Not good. So I want to know what is s of 5. So I'm going to use what version? We'll go ahead. They both look unfriendly. Let's do that second version. It looks less bad. So I'm going to go, well, we'll stick with the same one we've been using, the underlined one. So I'll go with this version right here. Negative 16, 5 squared plus 160 times 5. Uh, what is this going to be? Let's factor out negative 16. And we have a 5 squared plus some more. 10 times 5. Seems right. Oh, that should be a minus. Wow. minus, yes, so 10 times 5, so it's 25 minus 50, which is negative 50, negative 25, so it's 16 times 25, which is a lot of 25s, 
Move those recorders. All right, so 400. 400, and we think we're measuring in feet somewhere. Hopefully. No, I didn't say feet anywhere. All right, so this is in feet. Nice to know what units you're working in, and T is in seconds. So reach 400 feet at uh, after five seconds. So that's max height. All right, what is the velocity when the rock is 256 feet above the ground? So what we got here, velocity, ah, well, we know the velocity function. That was negative 32t plus 160. Uh, when the rock is 256 feet above the ground. So how do we figure out what time that's occurring? So if we look at the graph, 256 feet above the ground, we know the max was 400. 256, so let's say somewhere right about there, a little more than halfway. So first thing to notice, there's two different times where this is going to occur. And how do we find them? We're going to set the S of T function equal to 256. So what time is the height equal to 56? So we want S of T equals 256. And we'll go with the, I think the original, which is 160T minus 16 T squared equals 256. All right, let's start by dividing by 16. That will give us 10t minus t squared equals, oh, something. I have to cut it in half four times, so 256. Whoa. Oh, calculator. Let's pretend like I'm not using it. It's too late to do math in my head. Oh no, so it was 16 and I knew that before. <coughs> okay, so we're gonna solve for, algebra is way better than arithmetic anyways, so we're solving for a quadratic or solving for zero. So we've got zero equals t squared. So I'm adding t, I like my squares to be positive, so I'm gonna add t squared and subtract 10t. And we still got that plus 16. All right, I better be able to factor. I mean, multiplying makes 16, adding to make negative 10. So I know they both need to be negative. And certainly 4 and 4 is not going to work. 2 and 8, maybe. Negative 2 is negative 8, positive 16. Negative 2 minus 8 is negative 10. All right, there we go. T equals 2, T equals 8. And we'll look back at the graph for a second. Two and eight, does that seem reasonable? That seems very reasonable on my really hastily drawn graph. It certainly looks convincing. All right, still have an answer to the question. What is a velocity? So velocity at time t, oh, don't need to rewrite that, it's right there. So, my first t value, I want v of 2. Negative 32 times 2 plus 160 is negative 64 plus 160. 
96. Seems right, 96. Uh, we are measuring in feet, so this is feet per second, V of eight. Negative 32 times eight plus 160. So 32, 64, 128, 256. Negative 96. All right, so we have 96 and negative 96. Now we'll go back to the graph and see what that corresponds to, what those are, are slopes. So if I think of the slope at 2, slope was 96, and slope at 8 was negative 96. Well, that was a lot closer to 1 and negative 1. So what is the problem? The problem is scale. So I went 10 seconds across the entire board right here, but when I go up about half as far, instead of going 10, I went 400. So this is very not to scale. If I tried to measure where two would be, I would probably still be inside the dot right there. So yes, it looks like the slope is one, but remember when it goes over uh, some amount and up some amount, the over amount, is really small and the upper mount is huge. So this will be a slope 96 and negative 96. If you graph this to scale, it would probably look really steep. It would look something like that. So that's why I did not graph it to scale. It's all over in 10 seconds and it needs to go up 400. So it's gonna be a super steep parabola. All right, last up, when does a rock hit the ground? And what is the velocity when it does? All right, we answered the uh, when does a rock hit the ground already. We answered it by factoring. So no calculus needed. It hit the ground. That was our second t-intercept. So we already got 10, and that came out of the factoring we did right there. So t equals 10 is the when. Now velocity, I want v of 10, which is negative 32 times 10 plus 160. So it's negative 320 plus 160 is something. Oh, I could just wait for a couple minutes and drive you guys completely crazy. You're probably yelling out the number. Minus 320. Ah, I wish my brain was working right now. Ah, negative 160 feet per second. Wow, I am really tired if I couldn't see that. All right, negative 160, we're measuring in feet per second. All right, so that is pretty quick. That's a lot of feet in one second. Look out. Oh, that also, if you make it positive, that'll be the initial velocity as well. So the final velocity when it hits the ground is going to be well, I should say the final speed is the initial speed, or they are the same number, but they're negatives of each other. All right, so that's about all the questions we'll ask about this particular uh, problem. We're going to do one more economics problem.
So in economics, we have a cost function, C of x is cost to produce x units. So of course, we're gonna take a derivative. So what in the world is this? If you knew the C function, and it was a relatively nice and friendly function, you could take a derivative. So the question is, what does this mean? You could say it's the slope of the cost function, yes. Uh, but in economics, they call this the marginal cost. So if you're already producing x units, the derivative would be the cost to produce one more unit. So we're gonna start out with a cost function. Suppose, we'll do our example down here. Suppose it costs uh, we better measure in dollars, I guess, or whatever currency you're in, so it costs this much to build or to create, to build X thingamajiggies. So you gotta be careful if your examples, you were creating iPods, people don't really have iPods anymore, so those are all outdated, but thingamajiggies are gonna be in style forever. So that's why we're building them. Good long-term business plan. Now, if you build 10, how much is the marginal cost? Now, it seems pretty worthless if you're gonna build 10 uh, you know, what type of company builds 10, but thingamajiggies are a very exclusive product. And um, so we're only building 10, a limited run here. So if we already built 10, what is the marginal cost? So what would it cost to build uh, one more? So we're going to first take derivative. So this is the x derivative of x cubed minus 6x squared plus 15x. All right, 3x squared minus 12x plus 15. So this is the marginal cost. Of course, this is c prime of x. And c prime of, now I wanna know marginal cost at 10. So the real reason we didn't use big numbers is because I suck at numbers, so I picked the easy number that I can very easily plug in without looking at a calculator, even though uh, it's late and I don't like numbers. So these are easy ones. 100 squared, 10 squared is 100, times three is 300, minus 120 plus 15, uh, 180 plus 15, 195, hopefully. Five, that seems right. All right, so this is the marginal cost. All right, cost $195, we're not that exclusive. So that's the cost, if I was already building 10, that's how much it would cost to build one more. Now, one thing you're going to figure out, or that you will see, is this is an estimate right here. So, this is not the actual cost it would it would take to build one more, uh, but this is an estimate. So I'm going to sketch out why this is an estimate. So if we have some x value here, and that's some other x value, now our cost is gonna be some polynomial, so it has a curve to it. May not look exactly like this at these x values, but we'll work with this. What we did is we computed the 
the slope right here now has a derivative at 10. So we, we use 10 for x1. And our particular second x value was 11. So I want to go from 10 to 11. So we'll zoom in a little more. And this is, well, we use a C function. So this is C of x, no, yeah, C of x2 minus C of x1. That's the height right there. So that's the measurement of that height. And if I wanted the um, changes in x, that'd be x2 minus x1. What we actually did was we computed the slope right here. So we computed the slope. So what we got, now I better move that out of the way. What we did, we used the slope and we went one over so we went across one using the slope. So we went up, we said the slope was 195. Now, if we wanted to be uh, complete here, we would need a y-intercept to actually figure out the equation of the line. Uh, we've done this a lot of times before. The point slope form turns out to be a little bit better than the slope intercept form, which is what I wrote down here. And the, so that looks like y minus y1 equals m x minus x1. So this is the good old days of uh, algebra or precalculus. You'd have this. Now we're gonna substitute out some of these values. So y, y is f of x. So let me write out what we're actually gonna substitute in. Uh, y is f of x, slope, uh, so x1, I'm going to use the letter a, so that means y1 is f of a, and our slope is f prime at a. And I'm just going to substitute all these in here, so y is f of x equals our slope is f prime of a, x1 is a, plus y1 is, take a and f it. All right, so this is our, what we call linearization. Of f at a. There's a whole section we're going to do on linearization. Pretty much all you need to know about linearization is inside that box right there. And where does it come from? I think we call this a point slope form. It comes right out of there. You just have to translate uh, y's into f of x, uh, y1 into f of x1 or f of a, and your slope is f prime of a. So that's the linearization. If we apply it to this, I don't really feel like plugging in 10, getting C of 10. Ah, it won't be that bad. All right, so let's actually find the linearization. So I need to know what is C of 10? And that is 10 cubed minus 6 10 squared plus 15 times 10, 1,000 minus 6 100 plus 150, come on brain, you can do it. 400 plus 150 equals 550. I should never teach a night class. And not go well. All right, so we got 550. That is our linearization. So what we're doing, I'm just gonna turn the F's into C's uh, and A's into 10's. So, ooh. Wow, that was a big oversight. This is 
really a L of x, a linearization of x, not the original f of x. This will make a line, which is not your original function. So we got L of x equals our slope, which we derived earlier, 195. x minus 10 plus 550. All right, so that is L of x. If you really want the other form, all right, happy customers are important. Uh, you can go ahead and add those numbers together and get your y-intercept. All right, so that's your L of x function right there, your linearization, and that is the actual line that I started to sketch out right here. Now, depending on the curvature, uh, this could be more accurate or less accurate. So if your curve, your curvature is very low, uh, this will be more accurate. If your curvature is very high, meaning this function changes very quickly, uh, this is a very bad estimate. So it's really dependent on the curvature. And that is the end of this section. So we're gonna do trig derivatives next. And that's a good place to stop. And you may want to review, uh, go back to 1.3. We don't really need anything more than what we looked at in the review from 1.3. Uh, so you want to know definition of tangent as sine over cosine and cosecant, cotangent, secant, uh, and a little bit about the graphs. And I think we're going to use the sum or difference formula or uh, identity as well.